Welcome everybody, hope you're having a wonderful day. This is a really exciting webinar um, because one of the things that's so exciting about it is bringing together not only the, all the municipalities on an international movement to drive a critical mass for the COP26, but also bringing in a whole bunch of different stakeholders as well. I won't take, uh, I won't take too much more of the thunder because we have an amazing array of presenters who um, will be sharing their stories. This is just a little overview. We're gonna give it a little bit of the city's race to zero and why you join it. And that'll be Allison from Cusk who will be sharing that. There'll be details of the pledge and that will be shared. And then there will be a focus on the technical resources available to help with the reporting. And then just an overall kind of um, speaking to the alignment of different types of reporting mechanisms that you can use so that you can meet the criteria of the race to zero, as well as other reporting that your chances are you may be advancing as well. So I'd like to do a little bit of an introduction. We will have from C40, we're gonna have Josh Alpert and Leah Caron, who will be joining us and telling a bit about the story. We also have Shay O'Neill from the Global, Global kind of Mayors for Climate and Energy. And we also have, um, <coughs> sorry, Alison Ashcroft from CUSP who will be joining us, and also Amy Cow who will be joining us as well from, uh, the, from the CDP. So thank you so much for all of the folks, a real great collective effort bringing all of the different players together who will be sharing a little bit more of their story with us um, today on the webinar as well. And I will turn it over. Um, I, we have a variety of different speakers, so you're going to test out our ability to kind of interact and uh, uh, present uh, across the across the different teams of people and to the different slides. Um, if there's any questions that anybody has, please never be shy about asking any questions. You can um, just put them in the chat function. My I, I always encourage people to just throw all your questions in the chat uh, in the chat realm. We will have a Q&A time period following the presentation where we can get into a lot of the questions. But if you wanna just put it in there, if you're anything like me, you start out asking a question and then go on to another question, then you've forgotten what the question was that you wanted to ask before. So anytime you have a question, just throw it all in the chat and we will have a good um, discussion time period following the presentation. So I wanna thank all the presenters for taking the time to share this story and this instructions for the overall collective effort that is moving towards the race to zero. Great, thanks Gabby. Um, hello everyone, my name is Allison Ashcroft. I'm with the Canadian Urban Sustainability Practitioners Network. So a network similar to the Clean Air Partnership, but for all of Canada and uh, encompassing 17 of the large and leading cities uh, with some overlap in Ontario being Toronto, Mississauga and Ottawa. Um, I'm also uh, sitting today on the unceded and occupied territories of the Kwangan speaking people known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation. And I'm grateful for their uh, hospitality. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Race to Zero, but um, C the C40 team and team from um, GCOM have been uh, far more involved in the uh, development of the campaign. Uh, so I'm going to talk about it from more the perspective of how I see it as being valuable to us here in Canada and why CUSP is um, so um, enthusiastically getting behind it uh, and hoping to encourage uh, our cities to do the same uh, by signing on to it. So as you can see by this slide here, it is a global campaign that was led by the um, high level commission. Uh, so it was started by the UNFCCC. Uh, so it has the global branding of the UN and it has, um, it is going to be prevalent at COP26. Uh, so it really connects the, the global uh, agenda and the initiative to us here at home and um, in all of the climate emergency declarations that most of our cities have, have made and in the, in, in the targets and the climate plans that we're setting, it helps to really bring that global local connection in um, and particularly because COP26 is, such a, is, is, is so important in this particular year. Uh, so you can see that what they've done is they realize that there's multiple players and so they needed to bring together um, all of these multiple actors uh, under one brand or umbrella. And so it doesn't negate the global covenant of mayors, your commitments there or the investment agenda that investors have signed on to, but it helps to bring common language and a common goal um, around uh, net zero um, 
uh, emissions as, as, as the target. So as you can see, there's, uh, in, there's a separate way for race to zero, there's a separate path for race to zero for investors, cities, universities, regions, and also businesses. And so we're gonna be talking about the cities today. Go ahead, Gabby. So there we have our Mayor Plant from Montreal, uh, who is uh, one of the strongest champions for Race to Zero. And um, this is, a, I'm going to go back to my notes. I've been provided a couple of notes. So um, again, this is, this is looking to rally support for non-state actors. So those businesses, cities, regions, investors to send a signal to the national governments and promote a healthy, resilient, zero carbon recovery. Um, so the, the, what I take out of this with Race to Zero is the recognition that while federal governments are the formal parties to the Paris Agreement, um, that there are a whole bunch of other actors that are critical to meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please, Gabby. So here we have um, COP26, hopefully coming soon. Um, but there's also a couple of pre-events uh, pre as well. Uh, and there's a big... Um, push on my part um, to have cities be more, um, cities in Canada be more relevant and positioned and integrated into Canada's nationally determined inter contribution, which is the report that they're intending to file this year before COP26, every five years having to update and enhance the ambition around their climate plans. So you've probably seen the healthy economy, healthy environment plan that came out of the, out of, uh, the federal government in December. Uh, and then most recently their target of 40 to 45 percent reductions by 2030. Those are the those are the key elements that will go into this NDC when they file it this summer. The goal for us at CUSP was to have uh, integration of cities into that document so that there would be greater recognition of the role that cities are playing and enhance uh, in and in turn, um, more fluid finance flows uh, back to cities that are commensurate with the challenge that cities are having uh, in meeting their goals. Uh, that's not going to happen uh, for this year in terms of full vertical integration, but we're still working and having holding a number of events over the next couple of months to try and make sure that we're at least establishing some enabling actions in that NDC that recognize the role of cities and will help cities, say in the instance of, of um, setting science-based targets setting science-based targets and building up their carbon budgets and just providing greater support for cities to um, to move forward on their implementation of their plans. Thanks, Gabby. So why join? So here are the four, um, you know, the, the, the four reasons that are provided for why joining um, is is valuable to cities. Uh, you can see them there, so I won't read them off, but, um, you know, basically, uh, the thought is that a green and just recovery to the COVID-19 crisis and the objectives of the Paris Agreement are one and the same and none are possible without the others. And so uh, this race to zero is going to bring some resources to you guys. Uh, this is going to help you, for instance, um, in certain cities win the argument for climate action. So it helps to bring along others locally, um, but it also means you don't have to stand alone. You can point to this larger group of um, uh, cities within Canada and globally that are that are standing with you in the pursuit of net zero. Next slide. So I I think in particular for Canadian cities, here's the value um, for me, and this is why I'm putting as much time into it as I am. So. I think there's some opportunities to showcase the leadership that's in Canadian cities, which I don't think even our federal government is necessarily aware of. Um, and there's some opportunities for uh, global recognition of our cities. Uh, in uh, There's a September event. Uh, it's a pre-COP event for local government uh, in ministerial dialogues. Uh, we've got a few plans there to try and insert some of the work that uh, Canadian cities are doing. It's an opportunity, and this one I think is really important for me and the work that I do is to amplify the call from FCM and from our cities for greater policy alignment and resource allocation. So uh, I've been working pretty closely with FCM. There's some new policy resolutions that came out in the March 2021 uh, FCM board meeting that really talk about that multi-level climate action and building up greater govern, uh, multi-level governance between federal and, and local, uh, local governments so that we can be more aligned with one another, more supportive and collaborative with one another, and again, drive more dollars directly to cities. Um, I really think it's going to help activate local partners, particularly your universities. I'm underfunded. You're all underfunded. We're all over overtaxed uh, with the um, job that we have to do. And there's a lot of university students um, and professors who want to be more involved. And I think being able to bring universities on will bring some really big voices uh, to your 
council table um, and also help you with doing the work. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the activation potential of race to zero. And finally, I think it's really about recognizing that we need to transform the way we're working. So I think race to zero is a starting point, right? This COP26 is the starting point for us going forward. And it's really, and it's saying we all need to be doing this together. We need to be on the same page. We need to be in our V formation flying together uh, to make this work, uh, to gain greater efficiencies and um, and also to support municipal networks and other, other social infrastructure that's not really funded or supported right now because it's, just, it's, it's not recognized how critical it is that we be talking and building our relationships, shifting some power and, um, and working collaboratively together. I'll leave it there and pass it off to the team um, from C40 who's going to get into the real goods of things. Oh, I think this is still my slide actually. So this is the stats of, as of today. So as of today, 708 cities are involved um, or signed on to Race to Zero. There was only there was only initial goal to sign on a thousand. I mean, I think that's going to be well surpassed. We're already at 708. That's great thanks to probably mostly the C40 team who is just recruiting like crazy, spending a lot of time on calls like this. Um, in Canada, unfortunately, so far only seven cities. So um, they are Halifax, Guelph, uh, Montreal, Toronto, Ed, Vancouver, and Hamilton. And did I miss one? North Vancouver. Um, so those are mostly that came on as legacy sign-ons. Uh, now is the big push. We're just starting it to get the recruitment going. So there's a lot of work to do since we're only 1% of the signatories right now. And we are we have way more leadership in Canada than, than that. So uh, it hasn't really started. This is the first kind of kickoff of this um, recruitment to the Race to Zero. And you'll be hearing lots more about it. But here's the details from everybody else. Thank you so much, Allison. That was really helpful. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leah Chiron. I am the Deputy Director for North America at C40 Cities. So work closely with cities in both Canada and the United States. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm located on the traditional land of the Lenape peoples, past and present, and recognize the longstanding significance of these lands uh, for Lenape nations and honor with gratitude the people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Um, today, I am going to talk uh, uh, with you about what it takes to join the Race to Zero and how to go about making the commitment. Next slide, please. So there are five requirements to uh, signing on and making the commitment to the city's Race to Zero pledge. Uh, the first is really a political uh, statement or an endorsement of a set of principles. Um, which are listed here on the slide. So first, the recognition of the global climate emergency. Um, also, a commitment to uh, work to partner to align with keeping global heating below the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. There's also a commitment to really centering uh, equity and inclusivity um, in climate action at the center of all urban decision making. Um, in order not only to uh, reduce emissions and create resilient communities, but also to create thriving and equi equitable communities for all. Um, and then also it's about a commitment to really working together with lots of members of the community. So working with political leaders, but also businesses, trade unit, unions, youth, investors, and civil society, um, really to recognize again, the global climate emergency and to work together to help deliver on this science-based action that we need to overcome it. So that's the first requirement. It's really about making that you know, political commitment to working together, to aligning with the science and doing what has to be done. The second and the third requirements are around commitments to um, emissions targets. So the first is a commitment to reaching citywide net zero emissions in the 2040s or by 2050 at the latest. And this is in alignment with the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement. The second uh, target um, that's required is you have to plan to set an interim 2030 target um, for reductions, which is consistent with a fair share of 50% global emissions reductions. And my colleagues at CDP will talk about the resources that are available to help you um, in being able to set those targets. Um, I do want to mention that this initiative and COP26 and the Race to Zero, we're really describing it as the start of the race. This is the starting line. Um, so to make the commitment, you don't have to have all of your targets established to sign up. It's about making that commitment to get there and to start developing and, and adopting the targets. 
which will need to be adopted no later than 2022. The fourth requirement is about actually getting started and implementing. We know that you know it's not just about the commitments, we have to really accelerate our implementation. So to start working towards um, planning and committing to implementing at least one inclusive climate action, um, for example, procuring only zero emission buses starting in 2025. And we've got a whole list of actions that cities can choose from, or it can be something that you're already working on that's underway. We'll talk about that more in a moment. The final requirement is going to be about um, publishing your target and your action. Um, you can use your usual reporting platform if you're already reporting. Um, we'll talk more about that as well. Um, and then the requirement will be to report on your progress annually. Next slide. So I'll now talk about how you actually join, like what are the logistics, how do you do it? Um, it's actually really straightforward, which is the good news. <laughs> There's a portal um, that's hosted by C40, um, which you can find at citiesracetozero.org. You go to the Cities Race to Zero portal, you click on join Cities Race to Zero. Now you're starting the pledge process. Um, you're going to have all of the information that I just provided on what it takes, the commitments that are required to, to actually make the pledge. So you wanna, of course, look those over and make sure you understand them. Next slide. And then you will select, there's a drop down where you'll say where you'll be reporting. So really importantly, if you're already reporting, this is no additional commitment. You can still report through your existing platform. So CDP, ICLE Unified Reporting System is recognized, My Covenant, and also in Canada, the PCP BARC um, tool and reporting platform are recognized for participating in the city's race to zero. So if you don't currently report, you will say so in the forum and there will be you know, our partners that are there ready to assist you in figuring out how to do that uh, moving forward. And then you're going to select which action, at least one high impact action that you're, you as a city are ready to commit to or are already implementing. Um, like I mentioned, there are over 50 high impact inclusive actions that my baby, um, that could set your city on the path. Um, and you can also, you can, you can choose your own. Next slide. Um, then it's just, the pledge is really straightforward. If you go to it, you'll see you sign and submit, you, you, click the pledge. Um, importantly, only a mayor, council leader or equivalent at that level can actually sign the pledge or somebody that is authorized on their behalf. Um, but I will say that in many cases where cities already are committed to this level of ambition, there's no formal process that's necessary. You don't have to take a motion to council. Um, it's really up to the city to decide what's appropriate in terms of making this pledge. So if you've already done these things, there is a way to kind of come into the um, so the pledge is so long as you have that authority to do so from, from a leader in your community. Um, and then the next step is to get to work and, and really to, to use the partners that are mobilizing around this effort uh, to support you, to bring resources, to be able to actually, um, you know, start to reduce emissions, create more resilient and adaptive action, um, inclusive action, um, and do it as a community. Next slide. Um, so just one more on the action planning piece. I mentioned that in the portal, when you go in, you'll be able to see that there are these 50 inclusive climate actions that are available for you to look to, to see if this is, you know, one or, or several are those that you would like to uh, commit to as a city. Um, as I mentioned, all signatories have to commit to at least one. And this is important. It has to happen. The commitment has to happen before COP26 to at least one action. But again, if you're already doing something, um, you can input that here and all of that will be collected and then you'll be reporting year over year as part of your normal reporting pro uh, process on, on progress on that action. And I believe with that, that's my last slide on the, the basics of the logistics and what it takes to join the race. And I think I will turn over to my colleague, Amy, um, to speak about target setting and reporting. Great, uh, next slide, please. So one of the commitments, one of the part of the pledge is setting a 1.5 degrees Celsius targets. And so we recognize that different cities are at different places. So if you already have a 1.5 degree target, all you need to do is report it. If you haven't reported for, um, before, we're here to help. If you're not sure it's compliant, let us know. We'll help you check it. And if you don't have one, we'll also work with you on setting targets. Uh, there was a guidebook published in the fall by the Science Based Targets Network, and we can drop the link in, in the chat. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I am coming from an organization called CDP. Um, we're one of the reporting platforms and we also do technical support as well. And so specifically, this is um, the support that CDP is offering um, for municipalities um, in Canada. So we will support non ICLEI and non C40 cities in, setting, in selecting methodology, understanding what's required, outlining the steps and answering any questions. So if you have any questions, um, you can contact us at the email there. We will have a target setting workshop um, on May 26th. So that's part of a North America virtual workshop starting next week. There's also some FAQs. And again, the guide that I just referred to um, helps you figure out the different methodologies and processes outlined um, that will help you set a 1.5 degree target. Uh, next slide, please. So now I want to talk about one of the other requirements of the pledge, which is about reporting. So signatures should report their targets uh, through the reporting system you're already using. So, um, so I represent the CDP ICLEI Unified Reporting Platform. There's also My Covenant or PCP Bark. So if you haven't reported, you can pick any of the platforms and you're more than welcome to start reporting this year. Uh, next slide. Specifically, uh, for the Unified Reporting Platform and for reporting in 2021, um, you should report what you have, even if it's incomplete. Um, because the data goes to the partners and we are trying to aggregate the data, the reporting must be public. Uh, we will be uh, publishing shortly the list of questions that are recommended. Um, and again, there are no additional questions and there's no extra reporting. There's no fee to participate. And if you haven't done it before, don't worry, we're here to help. Um, and if you are doing it through the Unified Platform, uh, you should be uh, reporting by July 29th to receive, a, to receive a CDP score. In 2022, reporting will be mandatory and you will have to report against your commitments um, annually. And so the questions that will be required to report in 2022 will be aligned on what's recommended to report in 2021. Um, we're happy to support and we're we will be here if you have any questions about how to report this year. So if you report to the Unified Reporting Platform, um, CDP, this is how CDP can support you. So these are many of the functionalities of our platform since it is an online platform. So you can have multiple users, there's guidance for how to respond to questions, there's examples. Um, it checks to make sure that your target, um, that your inventory is a calendar year and a couple of basic um, calendar and data checks. Uh, you can receive one-on-one -on -one support from us. We also do a free service, that's a thoroughness completion check um, if you report by the July 29th deadline. Uh, we've offered a series of webinars and I'll also drop that in the chat as well. Um, and it is also available, the questionnaire and the platform is available in French as well. And also, of course, if you've reported in previous years, uh, your data copies over from year to year. So a quick note here is that uh, there is a way to opt in to reporting without having com formally committed. So you can always register interest and we can reach out to you and support you. So this is another way to express your interest if you're not ready to formally commit yet. And so if you have any questions about this, feel free to reach out to us, but this is what you'll see when you log onto the platform, you'll be able to see that show up. So once you've signed on to the, once you've, uh, the previous slide please. Yes, this one, thank you. Um, once you've signed on to the pledge, it'll show as committed. So if you already committed like uh, Vancouver or Montreal, then you will have already shown as being opted in. So we are talking to each other through the official pledge. So once the official pledge is, it's not instantaneous, but we will make sure to be tracking that and making sure that you are showing as committed to, so that you can com commit the reporting com commitment as well. So all this to say is that if you're not sure about it yet, you can always opt in. You can always reach out to us to learn more about how you can sign on. Or if you just want to do the reporting first, you can still just do the straight reporting first as well. Um, okay, I think I am passing to Shay. Yes, thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm Shay O'Neill. I'm with the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, uh, more commonly known as GCOM. GCOM is the largest global alliance for city climate leadership built upon the commitments of over 10,500 cities and local governments. And I'm currently based in Brussels, Belgium, uh, working for GCOM, but originally from the traditional territory of Tawasin and Musqueam First Nations in British Columbia. So happy to be here with you all as a Canadian as well. Um, sorry, can you go back, <laughs> Gabby? 
So I'm first going to talk about the city's race to resilience. And although this is coming at the end of the of the presentation almost, I don't want to make it seem like it is any less important than the city's race to zero. The reason why we don't have as much information on the city's race to resilience yet is simply because it was launched quite a bit later than the race to zero by the UNFCCC uh, climate champions. Uh, but we are working on it. So this group of partners, including a few others like the Resilient Cities Network, has been accepted as an official partner of the Race to Resilience. And for those of you who don't know, the Race to Resilience is a sibling campaign for the Race to Zero and is designed to put people in nature first in pursuit of a resilient world. The overall big objective of Race to Resilience is to build the resilience of 4 billion people from vulnerable groups and communities by 2030. We're working at a city level now with all of the partners here uh, to develop the city's pathway for this, uh, which will include uh, cities committing to assess their climate risk and vulnerability, and then also a resilient action, uh, just like the Race to Zero. And you will soon be able to find out, you can find out more information now on the cityswracezero.org, but you'll soon be able to register uh, your commitment on that same platform as well to make it easy for you. Now next. So I just want to also talk a bit about the connection between GCOM and Cities Race to Zero and Race to Resilience. Uh, both campaigns are in line with GCOM. As a signatory of GCOM, your city is already working towards decarbonizing your economy, and the Race to Zero campaign offers a new voluntary opportunity to raise your ambition. Uh, GCOM very much encourages any signatory to join both races. Specifically uh, in Canada, for cities that haven't already signed on uh, or committed to GCOM, you can do this at the same time. We encourage both um, committing to GCOM, you're committing to long-term climate action and continuing your work uh, beyond COP26. And cities can report to GCOM and Race to Zero and Race to Resilience through both uh, CDP ICLE and PCP BARC to make it. And a few common questions that we've been getting about uh, the connection between DCOM and the race to zero. Uh, if you're already a commit city committed to DCOM, should you join the race to zero? Yes. As I mentioned, we support cities to join both of these races. Um, reporting remains the same. You don't have to change anything if you're already reporting. And as far as the commitments aligning, Race to Zero is in line with GCOM, but you still have to go to cities.racetozero.org and register commitments specifically to the Race to Zero. And in addition to your GCOM commitment that you've made already, you have to make sure that your commitment is to reach net zero uh, by 2050 at the latest and setting a, a medium term science based target. And although Race to Zero does not require specifically the development of a climate action plan, uh, it does require you to commit to one of the actions, as I mentioned earlier, and this could align with your climate action plan. Yeah. Uh, so to, to conclude the presentation today, just quickly to go over next steps. So. If you want to join Cities Race to Zero, again, you can, you can visit citiesracezero.org and click Join Cities Race to Zero. As Leah mentioned, the steps are very clearly laid out, so you can follow those. And please feel free to let us know if you have any questions. If you're a city who's already in the Race to Zero or after you commit, uh, we'd also love for you to share this. Um, and we'd love for you to be a champion in this race, specifically you know, as Allison mentioned, only a few cities right now from Canada, and we'd love to showcase more and really have uh, more Canadian representation at a global level. So please reach out to us and we'll start to share your story and also help you. Um, you can help us and we'll help you recruit other cities in Canada as well. So please feel free to reach out. And I think we're going to go on to questions now. 
Perfect. Thanks so much, Shay. Um, thanks so much for everybody's question. Thanks to all the presenters for sharing that information. We do have a number of questions that I'll just be getting um, on to as well. Um, just the first, one of the first questions is regarding fair share targets. And thanks to uh, the, some of the presenters who are answering questions in the uh, chat. Really appreciate that. Um, a re, re fair share targets. Can, can you confirm that by 2022, what kind of commitment to the fair share targets is required for the, in particular for the 2030 target that our, our climate change plan is built on, but it doesn't include the fair share adjustment. Do we need a council resolution? Also, our different methodologies offer very different results for us, either a 55% reduction or an 80% 87% reduction, those have different implications. Any guidance in terms of it, uh, what the 2030 targets um, need to be or the methodology used for it? Who can I ask to? I'll jump in then first. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. um, so there's a great guidebook that was pushed out in maybe November or December of last year oh. by those on the call along with a couple others. Um, called the it's the uh, setting science based targets for cities guidebook, um, and maybe somebody, maybe Amy, you could throw the the link into the chat box for it. Um, it's a great document. It came along at a really timely, uh, at a really was really timely for me because I was starting to try and figure out what how to help and support cities in setting their carbon budgets and, and science based targets. And it gave me it it has some really good information around the complexities of that. And let's be real, like it's it's complex and very technical, and I, I don't. And it's, you know, it's carbon budgeting hasn't even been, like, there's not even a carbon budget set for Canada, right? There's no fair share carbon budget that's been uh, named in Canada. So for cities to be doing it, it's, just, it's, um, there's a lot to think about. And like you said, Glennis, like it, you can get a really big range of what your 2030 target should be using science-based targets, but depending on what you've decided, the, the equity or your burden share um, for Canada and or for your city should be, uh, and maybe even based on your reliance on carbon capture and storage uh, can totally change what that 2030 target is too. So we have we have created a calculator that I'm gonna hopefully get added into this guidebook to try and support cities and not giving you a prescriptive, like this is what your target should be, but saying, you know, using the very common or the most uh, published um, advocacy in Canada right now. So the Climate Action Network, as most of you know, Catabrew, um, along with the David Suzuki Foundation and um, Environmental Defense Canada have said that we need 140% uh, reduction target by 2030. That's They've divided that into two parts, 60% for domestic reductions and 80% for international cooperation. So we've modeled that and we've, and we've downscaled that to our Canadian cities to say, okay, well, if you want to take all of that on, if you want to take on the 140%, what would that look like for your city? If you wanted to just take on that domestic reduction target of 60%, what would that look like for your city based on your historic emissions, based on your population uh, at that baseline year of 2015, and then based on what your projection populations are going to be um, all the way through to 2050. So we're trying to do a lot of the, of the background work for you all so that you can do the real work, which is figuring out and having those discussions around what is your comfort comfort level around equity and burden sharing and what, you know, how confident are you around carbon capture and storage? How much of the total fair share of Canada's um, contributions to greenhouse gas reductions, is it reasonable um, to push down to the local level? There's, there's responsibility that we all share and then there's respondability. And if you're going to use your carbon budget to decide how you're going to invest in your infrastructure upgrades or in your services or programs you're going to offer, does it make sense to downscale that, that international cooperation when really that is, that is a finance flow that needs to flow from the federal government out to, out to you know, sub-Saharan Africa? So these are questions that, you know, um, that, that there's a conversation that needs to happen over the next year. And I'm hoping that we can convene that in a more consistent um, ways so that we can gain some consensus in Canada so that there's sort of that nesting dolls, those babushka dolls, so that when we, whatever we decide that Canada's fair share carbon budget is that we've got a, a very um, systematic way that we are hopefully um, downscaling those um, carbon budgets to the rest of Canada. And cities may choose to be more or less ambitious, but so that we at least understand what is what does that look like? Um, so hoping to help you guys out with that and working really closely with CDP and the C40 team and stuff like that to make sure that any methodology that we come up with is, is going to be approved by them globally. And and just, just to add in on what Allison said and some late breaking news that um, the uh, peer review group will be looking at Allison's tool early next week. So we're trying to fast track that to get it back out um, as quickly as possible, recognizing that 
uh, having any kind of regionally specific uh, methodology is going to be way better than these global ones that do present these crazy ranges. Um, and what I've typically, oh, and I'm Josh Albert, director of special projects at C40 and leading up recruitment uh, for Cities Race to Zero, um, based in Portland, Oregon, and situated on uh, Chinook land, uh, past and present, and directly across the street from one of Portland's newest parks, Kunamox, which is Chinook Wawa language, uh, spoken um, by only 650 people left. Um, so every day I am grateful that we still have 650 uh, people speaking Chinook Wawa uh, and a new program at Portland State to bring it back. Um, I, I typically talk with cities about 2030 targets, both as critically important, and in fact, the UN Secretary General today uh, the summit in uh, a climate summit in Europe uh, again expressed the need that um, if we can't get to about 48 uh, percent reduction by 2030, that the 1.5 degree goal for 2050 is um, in dire jeopardy. Um, so just to underscore the importance of it, but I also don't want folks getting too hung up in the technicality around it because it is also a, kind of a calibration tool uh, that will help you in your calendar and planning your climate actions. So if you're really far away from what a, a fair share would look like, that will tell you uh, that you probably need to kind of front load more transformational, bigger climate actions in the next couple of years, uh, rather than kind of spreading them out to 2050. So do use it as, a, as kind of a measuring stick as well that will help you plan your climate action planning uh, really over the next kind of five years. Perfect, thank you. And I, I do see there's a couple of, I'll ask a simple question that's um, uh, just as well to make sure. Um, my understanding it needs to be community-based targets, not corporate-based targets to the race to zero, correct? All right, perfect, thank you. And so there's a number of questions with regards to the divestment of fossil fuel uh, question and the criteria that will be used as part of that. Can you give a little bit of expect, uh, a kind of the requirements that will be with the, the, the divestment um, 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 the divestment criteria? Yeah, and, and just to be clear, that that's not an, a, a criteria of Race to Zero. It's one of the actions that cities can choose as, as their requirement for one inclusive climate action. Uh, the goal is that cities, you know, would choose more than one action. Um, we wanted to put a relatively easy bar for cities who are just starting out on their climate journey. Uh, and so you'll see in each of kind of the climate sectors, there's a range of actions for cities to take, starting with kind of basic early actions to really high ambition actions so that every city in the world can find where they are in that journey and pick an action that is going to uh, take them to the next ambition level. When it comes to the divestment action, um, I'll put up in the chat uh, a link to C40's uh, um, divestment work. And really, it, it kind of runs the gamut uh, between cities in terms of how far that they're going. But you can, you can certainly see the momentum that's happened over the past year in particular in uh, both cities divesting and universities divesting. And they all kind of tackle it slightly differently. And I won't go into, I won't take up the rest of our time just talking about divestment, but I'll put a link up for people to, to take a look at if you're interested in, in kind of approaching that as uh, one of the actions that your city is interested in taking. Recognizing that um, particularly within Canada, that might not be the most useful action uh, for cities to take, but if you are interested, you can also feel free to um, drop me an email after the presentation. We can talk a little bit more specifically about it. Perfect. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, and I did also want to kind of um, do a uh, call out and thank you to Allison for leading the carbon budgeting work and uh, agreeing to come back to the networks to share a lot of all, all the, the work that you've been doing and the um, and thanks for accelerating the approval of like the review of the methodology um, so that it can kind of come out to the municipalities uh, as soon as possible. Appreciate that. Um, can you share the link to the registration for setting the share fair target? Uh, we will, if, uh, if someone can, I think that already someone has put that link in, um, for that. So that thank you, Allison, providing for all the information on that. Um, so I, I think this is always going to be one of the questions that come as like the, 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 the dual kind of, you know, avoiding duplication in terms of reporting. And I appreciate that all the global kind of, the CDP and all of that, it's all coming together on that one. 
what is the expected reporting requirement for 2022? Is it just going to be like the CDP reporting or the global common of mayors that can ser serve for the race to zero as well? Correct. I did, re I did respond in the chat already, but there's no additional reporting requirements. You can already use the platform that you're used to. Um, if you're new to reporting, then we can walk you through the process. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm just looking to see if there's questions. That are, yeah, I'm looking. Perfect. I'll just say while Gabby's taking a look through the through the chat, I'm sorry, I've been trying to I've been trying to respond to some of them while while moving along. Um, I really I don't I you know I come from a small local government where I was like one of you know the sole sole staff working on this and and our big when we created Cusp one of our core priorities was to address data gaps and reporting burdens. So like I hear you and any resistance you have around signing on to yet another thing that doesn't bring any value to you and just creates more work for you. I don't see this as what that is what that is and also we're working really collaboratively with the folks who are defining um, what this process looks like to make sure that there will be more value coming to you than there will be time expended on on your part. As long as you are already Sign, as long as you are already reporting through CDP, which most of you are, and if you're not, I encourage you to do that as part of your transparency and accountability to your community and to you know, the global goals of the Paris Agreement. If you're not already, if you are already doing that, then this is gonna be very minimal in terms of the additional work that you are required to do. Um, the only thing that I saw as an additional um, big, push was around setting science-based targets and making sure that people understood what does that really mean. And, and, you know, it's not like, if you're like, wow, I really don't get what that is even talking about when people talk about carbon budgets, you're not alone because people throw around these terms and, and they mean very different things when they're using them. Um, and there are lots of science-based targets um, and they result in very different outcomes. Um, so there's a lot of work to do here and it doesn't need to be done individually by every single city. And so that's why we are trying to, to trying to bring a coherent response to that for Canada. And I think it's really important. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to y'all about that way more, but that's the only area where I saw this, that there was like a new, a, a new or supplemental requirement on that would be a time, um, sucker on staff. And so I think that we've addressed that. And so now all I see is a benefit to you guys. And, you know, we don't have communications people sitting at our side by right next to us trying to make the technical work we're doing make sense to those outside of the technical sphere. And this is what Race to Zero does. This is going to be a global brand that you're going to hear a ton of. Everybody's going to be talking about it, the universities or whatever. There's people are going to want to sign on to it. It's the, it's UN based. It's pretty their branding is going to be great um, it's accessible in its language this is stuff that we can't as cities produce um, certainly not with the budgets that we typically have in our sustainability departments so this is an opportunity to take your work and showcase it under this very professional brand that is on par with the technical nature of your work and the quality of the work you're doing it's communicating it in a way that we can't we just can't do on our own. I certainly see that for me at CUSP. I have no budget and very few little staff and whatever. This is a way for me to take the work that we're doing and put it under this large umbrella of Race to Zero and start to promote uh, the work that the Canadian cities are doing. And so that's that's why I see it as super valuable. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, Allison, on that one. I also think one of the key things that's really super important about this is it's starting to raise the profile of the implementation taking place at the local level that will help to augment the national message because the cops are always so focused on the national message. But it also can, you know, while there's a lot of effort that's gotten to the local implementation and the local leadership, it, it is challenging for them to get the profile that's needed. And it's especially highlighting some of the solutions that are getting put into play uh, so that it kind of coincides with the national message and often a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the challenging communications that take place around these international negotiations. And this is actually really bringing that, you know, moving from problem to solution. Oh, I, one more, I, I went through another one. Um, echo Aaron's comments regards to struggle to justify aggressive science-based targets for 2030 at the local level, um, um, given that we don't have the key levers needed to reach them. Um, well, I, I think one of the key things, I think that the ultimately what it, I think the message that we're all trying to kind of share on this one is that 
whether whatever our challenges are at the local level, and there are plenty of them, it doesn't change the fact that science is where we have to be following. Um, and we know that in order for us to get our net zero targets for 2050, we've got to bring that into our aggressive, that, that aggressive target into our plans and into our implementation. Because if we don't, then we really do run the risk of doing making decisions in the 2020s that are going to make our 2030s and 2040 targets almost impossible if we don't bring it right from the get-go and understanding where we need to be um, by that time frame. And Gabby, if I could just add to that, because I, I think that was brilliant and it's so right. But I mean, this is a real challenge, obviously, for cities that don't have all of the levers of power within, you know, your community. And at C40, I just want to offer that we've been thinking about this um, for our own cities um, in our membership. And really what we've advised is, you know, put be as transparent as you can, put forward a target that, you know, where you say this is what we think is achievable, but as ambitious as possible. And where there's a gap, acknowledge it and say, you know, here are the barriers that we face. We need more funding. We need whatever support from the community, from the federal government, whatever it might be. We need a cleaner grid, whatever the, the situation may be in your context and actually use this as an advantage, right? To be able, or, you know, as an opportunity to bridge that gap and to say, this is where the science is. This is what we can reasonably achieve. And here, you know, what else is needed? Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree on that one. Because it is really great highlight, like, you need, this is where science says we need to be. Here's our work plan for what are the, the action items that we can implement based on our existing resources. But with, here's a gap that we have to work <laughs> address this huge gap that, that's there. So I, I think it really does keep us all accountable while also recognizing how ambitious and how transformative we will need to be in order to achieve those targets. All right, so I'm thinking, I'm looking on that one. Are there implications? Oh, sorry. That last okay. one would be for Amy, I think, to answer around the CDP reporting deadline and the timing of your pledge. There is not. So because it is a one-stop shop reporting platform, we do encourage you to report by the deadline to receive the full benefits of reporting to CDP, including getting a private CDP score. But, um, you know, feel free to message me offline. We can we can definitely talk things through if you, you know, are facing kind of some kind of constraints because you can always report and then commit later. There's a variety of options that we can work you through. Perfect. Thanks. And I just wanted to kind of oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say all the comments that are coming in, you know, are are so relevant to and go well beyond race to zero and, and setting science based target. This is the this is the core problem, right? I mean, this is the core problem is that cities are are ambitious and leading and they've got plans that are um, incredible and they also involve a lot of stuff that they can't do um, and they don't have the money to do and they don't have the jurisdictional authority to do. And so, you know, this is the concerns here around setting a 50% target or 60% target or whatever is, is the same as having a plan that is also unrealistically like unrealistic to implement under current, under current, uh, under the current scenario of the way that cities are funded, um, the way that cities are staffed and like the capacity that cities have. Um, but we know that we know that we are best placed um, to do a lot of this work um, and that we need to localize if we are actually going to make sure that this green recovery um, benefits all and, and brings um, you know, people out of poverty um, and brings up equitable well-being for everyone. Like there's only, you can only do that if you do this locally. So we know the, we know how important our work is. So part of it is we also just need to really start to get together and push on FCM to change the language around how cities and particularly the big cities are looking to be supported by federal government. We need multi-year funding for strategies and for implementation of our plans. You guys know what you need to do in your cities. As long as we're tracking and aligning our plans to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the federal plans and more importantly, to our fair share carbon budget and to what is required of Canada to meet its contributions to the Paris Agreement, then we need to, you know, if we have that in place and we can show them that we have the tools in place, then the work is to get them to fund that properly and also to work collaboratively and in greater alignment with the federal government um, so that we're we're not banging our head on against the wall, right? We can't just create these ambitious plans and have and keep and keep 
the systems the way that they are currently. So we're working on that. Aaron, yes. How can we help you do that? Please. I will, I will get on the phone with you guys. Um, we, we need to have a call on this for sure for Canada. Like we, this is the work I'm doing with FCM. It's work that I, you know, thank God these guys have descended on Canada and we've got a lot more uh, voices and influence on, on FCM and others to kind of keep, um, keep us accountable and also bring us some resources. So uh, it's happening and it's a conversation for that's larger than Race to Zero. I don't think it should be what, what prevents you from signing on to Race to Zero because as a reminder, your plans are already more ambitious than you can possibly implement in current situation. We just need to change the way that the federal government recognizes us. And one of the ways to do that is to be part of Race to Zero because it reports up to the Global Climate Action Platform just as all the countries who have signed on to the Climate Ambition Alliance do. And all of a sudden we have that convergence and we'll be able to show, and a lot of the work that I'm doing right now is showing how our cities are contributing to um, the actions of Canada, as well as how significant our greenhouse gases concentration is in our cities and how important we are as a partner if, the, if Canada actually wants to meet its climate action targets. So for instance, at the moment I'm visualizing, we've taken all of your reporting from CDP and we're visualizing it in Tableau so that we can start to show the aggregate impact of cities also start to show some of the similarities and differences between the climate risks and hazards you've all recognized um, and the actions that you're taking. So it's it's a process right now that's still a little bit in, 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 in its infancy, but about ready to show you guys sort of where we're going with it. But the idea again is we need to show how significant cities are, how ready cities are, and how much they need more support in finance and in policy alignment from the federal government. Thanks so much. Could Yes. <laughs> I think one of the also things I wanted to kind of highlight as part of this is that um, part of this, part of the goal in this is also to build this critical mass. And one of the things that I think has been something that's kind of um, um, undermined the collective effort on climate change is the fact that we focus on on the kind of the sheer enormity of the challenge. And um, we really need to kind of show that critical mass happening as we reach into 20, COP26. Like we need COP26 to really work to build all of us together to support us and help build the foundation, not just across your municipalities, but across all sectors of society, whether it be industry, whether it be the finance department. In particular, one of the key things that's really important is we need to make sure that all levels of government are rowing together towards this because the challenge ahead of us is huge but we know that the solutions can be put into play we know that a lot of the solutions are going to get implemented at the local level but we need to build the critical mass of the alignment between municipal governments provincial governments and federal governments all working together and all supporting each other to actually be able to enact all the opportunities for reductions that are available to them and i think that's one of the key messaging i think like we, building that critical mass of messaging that municipality municipal and local implementation is really important and that provinces need to support their municipalities. And we have a particular challenge in, in that, in terms of Ontario, in terms that we have a provincial government that's not showing a lot of provincial, uh, not showing a lot of climate leadership at the provincial level. So that's one of the reasons why I think that there's this, you know, cr uh, pressure um, and uh, for calling that out. Great, okay. Any, I don't think I, did I miss any other questions? Let me just see. Um, There's the yeah. concern around the provinces and that's a real concern for sure. Um, and I just responded, you know, for now I'm one person. So for now I'm really focusing on the federal local alignment because it's very complicated and very political at the provincial level, as y'all know, particularly if you're in Alberta, Saskatchewan or New Brunswick. Um, so, but, um, but again, I'm happy to talk with you guys offline and 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 see how we might be able to support your conversations there. But uh, but it's really the the complication of the conversation between the federal and provincial governments in those provinces. That's that's again giving an opportunity, I think, for cities right now to get out from under. Um, being creatures of the province in those provinces because the federal government needs to work with cities and if they can't do it through the provinces that's why fcm is getting um, as much money and attention as they are right now is because because those provincial relationships are a little bit um challenged yeah. but anyways happy to again to talk to you about that mike directly um, and also with the city of calgary we should probably join uh, who i was talking to yesterday about some of this perfect 
Thanks so much. I want to thank everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to all of our presenters for taking the time to uh, present the race to zero and the format and the criteria as well as the um, and, and even I really want a big, big shout out and thank you for all kind of helping to build the alignment across the different reporting mechanisms so, so that we, we, we can reduce duplication as much as possible. Totally appreciate that and thank you for that. Um, and uh, also I want to thank everybody um, for and I'm so glad that uh, this effort is taking place to build that le local leadership and to show the critical mass of implementation taking, pl taking place across all stakeholders. We really need to build that um, support and make a COP26 a very successful event to set us up right for the, uh, the 2020 decade ahead of us in terms of really scaling up the ambition and boldness of the actions and the implementation of our actions within our plans. So thank you to all our presenters. Thank you to all the participants for joining us today. I will let you know, like I sent out the um, PDFs of the presentations, but we, I'll, send, uh, I'll send you all out as well, the recording for where this can be uh, accessed and shared. Please share as widely as you possibly can. In addition, I'll also kind of steal a lot of the links that were in that and throw that into the proceedings as well through this. But I really want to thank all of our presenters today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, thanks everybody. Gabby. Have thank a great you, Gabby. day. Bye. Gabby, thanks for organizing. You're always oh, great. Oh, no problem. No problem. My pleasure. Have Appreciate a great day, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>